Hello and welcome to this virtual session. We're glad you can join us today. Before we get started, there's a few housekeeping items we'd like to go over with you now. Firstly, you can resize the webinar windows to cater to your viewing preferences. You can maximise, minimise and drag the windows to your preferred viewing size. If you look at the bottom middle of your screen, you can click on the widgets that you'll need to get the most out of this virtual experience. Secondly, Microsoft specialists are on hand to answer your questions in real time. So feel free to type in your questions using the Q&A window and we'll answer them as soon as we can. Lastly, we've provided some additional resources for you to supplement your learning. You can access them by clicking on the links in this section. Without further ado, I'll hand over to our speakers. Hello everyone, welcome back to day two of Azure Fundamentals. Today, we'll cover module three, where we're going to discuss security, privacy, compliance, and trust. And then we'll finish out our day with module four on pricing and support. Let's dive into module three, where we're going to talk about security, privacy, compliance, and trust. And really, we're going to cover a lot of things, inch deep, mile wide again with this uh, module. We're going to talk about some security services. We're going to talk about the layered approach to security. We're going to talk about governance. We're going to talk about monitoring. We're going to talk about privacy, compliance, and trust and a little bit of everything in between. So we have a great module for you. As you can tell, I get excited about this because there's some really important topics. But like I mentioned before, this can be a whole topic, a whole class. As a matter of fact, it is. If you really want to become a security expert in Microsoft technology, specifically Azure, take a look at the course AZ500 and it's security in Azure. You basically get four to five days of all this stuff. So we're going to dig right in and really we're going to start about a concept around defense in depth. And, and, and this shouldn't be new to everybody. Whenever we approach security, we have to approach it at looking at layers of security. We have to start with the physical security. Do we have friendly people at our front desk or courteous and somewhat unfriendly people at our front desks? Are our buildings secure? Do we have locks? Do we have badges? What's our user ID and password? Do we have security on the perimeter? Do we have security on the inside of the network? And wait, perimeter and network are the same thing? No, no. Sometimes we are known as hard and crunchy on the outside, but soft and chewy on the inside. But we have to think about this, that we have to assume that hackers are going to try to breach, and if not try to breach, actually breach any one of these layers. So we have to put up all these walls from perimeter to network to what happens on the actual compute, what about the application to the data itself, which is where their ultimate goal is. They're trying to get inside there. So we have to think about this in a layered approach to security. And when you start working inside of Azure, the great thing about this, just like we do with compute with shared responsibility, we also have shared re security responsibility. And we think about on-prem, you're responsible for all of this. But now when you start looking at the different workloads from IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS, now you get some help. Now you get some security under the covers to help strengthen your security story to make sure that it's very difficult for the VAD folks to get in and take your information or become a part of it. And really it all starts with the story of the physical security. And, and when you look at our data centers, they're hard to get into. And if you get a chance to go and give a tour, you definitely want to go tour these facilities. Not everybody gets to do this. And by the way, we're one of the few vendors that let you come in and tour our data centers, but it's all done in a very secure fashion. Bear in mind that everything we put in our data centers is safe and secure and locked behind doors, folks. And that's where you're trusting us as a, as, as a customer of Azure, looking at those layered approaches. But when we start talking about security after the physical security, what's the area where you have to protect the most? And that's identity and access. And we're going to talk about those core identity services we have in Azure right now. And really it starts with the concepts of authentication versus authorization. You have to understand the differences between the two. Authentication is simply proving who you are. That's logging in with your user ID and passwords, establishing your identity. If you go to a professional sporting event, this is your ticket. Your ticket lets you get past the guard of the gate so you can get into the stadium. That's part of that, what that ticket does. The ticket does the other part, which is authorization. What seat can I sit at? Where can I buy my food? Am I in the club level? Do I get to go down close to the sidelines or am I stuck in the nosebleed seats? When you think about this, you have authentication always happens first. You prove who you are, followed by authorization. Inside of Azure, we authenticate with Azure Active Directory and our authorization of what we can do inside the actual subscriptions is done with what is called role-based access control, both of which we're going to cover inside this module. So understand, authorization happens after authentication, proving who you are, and then what can you do with that information. And really it all starts with Azure Active Directory, our identity solution. Now, why do we spend time on this? And why do we talk about authentication, authorization, and Azure Active Directory? Because this is how we authenticate. 
your user IDs and where they're stored is important. And folks, if you don't believe me, a little bit of homework for you. There's an excellent book out there called The Cuckoo's Egg. It was written in the early 80s, and it talked about an identity solution. It was written by a gentleman named Cliff Stoll, and he found a hacker had compromised a mainframe computer, found a user ID and password, and was trying to use the Berkeley's network to break into ARPANET. The hacker was in Germany. So if you don't think identity matters here, especially in the security store, it's vitally important. And the great thing about Azure Active Directory, you have a centralized identity solution that really helps govern access to everything we do, from our authentication, we can have set up single sign-on. We have application and device management. And when you think about this, folks, just to be very open and honest, it's not necessarily what you might think from a, from a group policy or an Intune or AirWatch or mobile iron perspective, but when we think about application and device management in Azure Active Directory, application management, for example, is what applications are users allowed to do single sign-on? And because of the way that Azure Active Directory designed, there's over 3,000 applications that know how to use Azure Active Directory for authentication into those applications. And device manager simply put, my laptop here, guess what? Can it get in to Azure? Well, I had to be given permission at the laptop. This device can be managed and used to leverage. But we also have business to business uh, consumer tenants, so we can actually have our business to business trust. And we also have business to customer tenants and identity services built into Azure Active Directory. But the problem becomes is that we have this term Active Directory and we have it in two places. We have Azure Active Directory and then we have Active Directory on-prem known as Active Directory Domain Services. And what's the difference? First off, they're very different. You can't think, well, hey, I have Active Directory on-prem, I know what Azure is. No, no, they're, they're, they're different to the point of how we talk to them. With Active Directory on-prem, we use LDAP, we use Kerberos for authentication. There's no federation services built in. We have a concept of organizational units and how we organize our users and groups. In Azure, it's not a one-to-one -one a comparison, but when you look at resource groups, they're kind of replacing the need of what we do with organizational units. But in Active Directory on-prem, we had a fantastic uh, management solution called Group Policy, where we could really control users' desktops. We don't have that in Azure Active Directory. If you want to do group policy-like things, you can use Intune, which is our cloud-based solution for full device and application management inside of Azure. But what makes Azure Active Directory special? It's cloud-based. It speaks common protocols. We access it via HTTP or HTTPS. We use common APIs. So not only the applications that are in the cloud today can leverage it, but applications your developers write can leverage Azure Active Directory for authentication purposes. But we also use SAML, WS Federation, and OpenID for authentication, and OAuth for authorization. These are common industry protocols. Why is this important? Well, it leads us into our federation services. Azure Active Directory can speak to many, many applications in the world today. Some of the most common, Salesforce, Box, Dropbox, G Suite, Amazon Web Services. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Matt, wait a second. Azure Active Directory can speak to Amazon Web Services? You betcha. As a matter of fact, you can use Azure Active Directory as your authentication mechanism if you have a dual cloud strategy, which a lot of our customers do. You can have one central managed identity with Azure Active Directory and users can log in with that user ID and password and be allowed to use Amazon Web Services. We can have true single sign-on across all of these services. But at the end of the day, that's all Active Directory, Azure Active Directory is. It's a flat structure, users and groups, and that's all. It's extremely powerful, but all the other things are done by the other components inside of Azure. So when we look at Azure Active Directory, it is radically different than Active Directory on-prem. But when you look at the cloud world that we're in today, guess what folks? It's perfect for what we're doing inside the world that we have today. More importantly, one of the things that Azure Active Directory comes with folks is multi-factor authentication. Not just Microsoft, but many of the security vendors in the world today have simply made one statement and it might've shocked all of you. Your user ID and password is no longer enough. Why? It just takes time to crack any password. It just takes effort. So now what do we do? How do we, how do we set this up? Remember, authentication is proving who you are. All multi-factor authentication is proving who you are in multiple ways. And it's around three big tenets. Something you know, that's your user ID and password. Something you possess. This might be your phone, it might be an application on the phone, or it might be a text message. How many of you have forgotten a password of one of your common SaaS applications today? and you can't remember, and all of a sudden you get a text message with a little verification code that you put in the forgot password screen, and you get your password reset. We do this today. And then something you are, that's your biometrics, it's your face. Windows Hello is an example 
that does all three. Because on our laptops, we have Hello enabled, so I can just basically log in in the morning with my face, and it logs me to the system. But to set that up, I had to first know my user ID and password. I had to set it up on this laptop, and then I can use my face to log on. So when we think about it, it's fantastic. However, folks, it does have a, it does have a dark side. One thing about multi-factor authentication you have to realize, you're going to forget your actual password. And you're going to have problems with this. And when you have to reset, I don't know what it is. Fun story, I was blessed enough to go to Hong Kong uh, a, a while back, a few months back, and I got to go deliver some training. And I had to print some things out on the printer at the, at the Microsoft office. And I go to the printer, I'm all ready to print, have my badge, and it says, uh, before you can print, you need to verify your identity. Can you log in with your user ID and password? Um, I didn't, I didn't know what my user ID and password was, so I had to go reset my password to log onto the printer so I could use my badge to print out the stuff for my course that I happened to be delivering. So understand when you get into multi-factor authentication, you will most likely change your pass, or lose your passwords and may have to change it. But because you're using multi-factor authentication, a lot of organizations are lengthening their password histories. It doesn't matter anymore, because we're not using that. We're using different mechanisms to verify your identity. And I thought it was something like 95% of password brute force attacks are thwarted because of multi-factor authentication. You have it in Azure Active Directory, it's available to you, and folks, if you're not turning it on, I'm just pleading, 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 pleading. Turn it on inside your environment that's gonna help prevent those identity uh, crises that you may have if somebody compromises your information. So our identity services, core, Azure Active Directory is what we do inside of here. So that's our first layer. What's our next layer? Network. How do we start securing the network? And everybody's familiar with this, right? How do we start talking about it? In Azure, we have network solutions. We have to look at layers. We have the perimeter layer. Why, you, you all had this. We had this today. You have firewalls. You have really big firewalls that sit out there. And, and if I had to guess, let me think, okay? You have port 443 open and maybe port 80. That's all you have open. But you have to start protecting it. Because you got to open up ports. That's how you do business. We got to let people in to get to our website so they can order our products and services. That's our perimeter. Now, how do we prevent things from happening inside there? So if I have 443 opened up, how do I protect it? Why well, throw a firewall there? And commonly known as a layer seven firewall or a stateful firewall, or in our case, is a web application firewall. It's just on the very edge. And what it does, it scans the information. Just like it is when I go to the airport. What's the first thing that happened? I have to go to TSA, have my ticket, have my ID, I can get in. Everybody can go there. If they have a ticket, they're allowed to walk into that environment. Now what happens? If you've traveled lately in an airport, what happens after you get past the security person? You throw all your bags on a scanner, they get scanned, and you yourself walk through some kind of scanner. It's exactly what a firewall does, folks. That's all it does. It's just at the very edge. Yeah, you can come in port 80 and 443, but now we're going to verify who you are. Then we also have a special protection, denial, distributed denial of service protection. And every customer gets this in Azure, and there's a basic feature that everybody gets. It's free. And we also have a standard feature which does a little more proactive remediation if things like happen. And all this is, a distributed denial of service attack, is a hacker just floods your internet with so much traffic, guess what? Real traffic can't come in. Azure's been protecting it since really the beginning of Azure, preventing from these styles of attacks. We have the networking layer. Now, we're past the perimeter. What about inside our networks? If you think about your world that you live in today in your data centers, how many of you actually were very secure on the inside? Or you just hoped the firewall would keep all the bad people at bay? Well, a lot of the really good social engineer hackers in the world today, they know how to walk around your firewall. In other words, they leveraged a really friendly receptionist and were able to walk by your perimeter layer. Now they just have to little put a port scanner inside your, any one of your open jacks and they're in the network layer. But can they do things? Well, inside of Azure, we use a concept, and I'm telling you what, folks, it is a huge concept. They're called NSGs, or Network Security Groups. They're a filterer. They're not a firewall. They don't inspect traffic. They're a stateless, and some people would call it a stateless firewall, but just a filterer. It filters inbound and outbound traffic. It's very easy to set up. And basically, a network security group is, who are you, and where are you trying to go? Either I'm going to let you go there, or I'm going to deny you. And that's it. But that's on the inside of the network, and it fine-grained filterer. And I'm going to show this to you as we take a look at some of these technologies, but now it makes it easier to secure the inside of our networks, all right? And that's the networking layer we have. When we look at Azure Firewall, we already talked about it's inbound and traffic firewall, what, what ports can come in. And now we can come in and look at firewall. We can look at 
what happens inside those packets. And the application, the Azure Application Gateway has this built in for your applications behind it. So there's a couple ways inside of Azure to do this. Now folks, this is the Azure Firewall. I want you to have a firewall on the perimeter of your environment. I don't really care which one you want, uh, use, use something. We have a lot of uh, common vendors, Palo Alto, F5, just to name a few inside of our marketplace folks. Use them, have something on the perimeter of your network scanning that traffic. We have some great built-in services, but if you're familiar with some, just use one, all right? Then we have distributed denial of service. Everybody gets this basic service for free. I will tell you for most customers, the basic free service is going to be perfect for you. If you add the standard service, it's transactional based and can be kind of costly, but it adds mitigation. Um, it helps protect all your other resources. And really when we talk about cost and security breach, What's the cost if you get breached, right? What happens inside of your environments and how do you want to prevent that? Or what's the cost if your customers can't get to your website because it, for some reason, got by the basic service? I will tell you most customers are very, very happy with the basic service, but you might want to consider the standard service. Now, what about the inside? I've gotten past the perimeter. I'm valid traffic, I'm allowed port 83. Now, how do I move around inside of Azure? Firewall, DDoS, perimeter, external. Network security groups inside of Azure. So when you start working with your traffic, how do we dive in and use all of this? We have some default rules we'll take a look at in a few minutes. As a matter of fact, let, we're going to talk about that because the great thing about network security groups is that we don't have to necessarily use all kinds of fancy things. We can use application security groups as a part of our NSG story. And I'm going to show you the network security groups and where ASGs come in. But the great thing about application security groups, they allow us to group computers by names. In other words, I don't have to know their IP address, I don't have to know anything else about them, I just have to put them in a name, a, a group name that allows me to organize it and, and control flow of traffic. And when we see the network security group here in just a minute, you're going to see how application security groups can actually govern all of that. So let's take a look. Let me show you what network security groups can do and how we can set it up. So I'm going to hop in fairly quickly because I want to show you the power behind these things. So I'm going to hop into my environment, I'm going to go to my network security groups. I'm going to hop into my uh, AZ Fun network security group. And I'm just going to go right to the inbound rules and I'm going to go right to add. Now I hop in here very quickly because this is where the power of the network security group lies. It's a fairly straightforward full, uh, filter. And notice the first two options here. First one says, source, any, where are you coming from and what port are you coming from? Every network traffic has to have an origin port. But look at the any, it says any source, but look at the choices. I can choose an IP address range, so you have to know how to use site or addressing to control what subnets are going to be coming inside of that. I also have service tag. What's a service tag? Services. And notice the default one is internet. So this says, if I have traffic that's come from outside of Azure, internet-based traffic in here, I can lump everybody into internet traffic. I don't have to worry about IP address ranges, I don't have to worry about any of that. But notice the service tags we have here, because it's really, really big. We have virtual networks. This is virtual networks inside of Azure. So we have a rule specifically for our VNets inside of Azure. But as you scroll through this list, look at all the Azure services that are there and they're all designed to help you filter traffic inside that list. And notice when I get down into storage, storage it's broken down into regions. So if I only know a certain region can come into this area, guess what, lock it down. Why say any, any when they come inside of it? Lock down to those very specific resources that we have inside of Azure. It helps you control traffic because guess what? If I choose Storage Central India, which just happened to be the one I landed on, guess what? If I don't come from Storage Central India, I don't get in. It's blocked, right? I have to be on that list. So let me go back. We're going to have some fun with this. So I'm going to say any. I'm going to leave the port range at wide open. Although generally speaking, if you know where the port's coming from that's supposed to get in here, lock it down again. Destination, where are you trying to go? Who are you and where are you trying to go? The destination, any, IP address range. Are you trying to go to a specific network because a network security group can sit in front of multiple virtual networks or I can do application security group so I can have that group of computers. And they work like this. I maybe have all, uh, all of my web servers grouped in a thing called web server. I'd say internet traffic can talk to web servers. And then under web servers, I might have my database servers, and that means web servers can talk to database servers. In other words, a hacker, if they're going to try to come in, they have to go through the web servers before they can get to the database servers. Everything else is just blocked. So for us, just to have fun, I'm going to say any. And what port do you want to go to? I'm going to say 3389 is my port. Um, I can use any protocol here. I'm going to use TCP. 
And this one I'm going to deny. And I just want you to make note of the priority rule, which is currently 310 that we have inside of it. And the port, I'm just going to say RDP2. And I'm going to go ahead and click on Add. And I want you to take a look at what we have here once this rule is created so we can see it. It'll come up here in just a moment. And then we'll talk about how this works inside of Azure. So let me just refresh this so I see it. Now, Garrett, I'm going to ask you a question. Notice that I have two rules here. I have one over 3389, TCP any, allows, and one that denies. And best guess here, what do you think? Are we going to let traffic in, yes or no? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say we're definitely going to let traffic in because of priority of the rule. Yeah, exactly right. I, perfect, high five, good answer, all right. Folks, understand this. Most of the times when you think about security, you think deny always wins. Not in the case of network security. But what did I tell you it was? It was a simple filterer. And here's how it works. When a packet comes across the network security group, it says, who are you? Where are you trying to go? And it looks at the rule. And the minute it gets an answer to that question, it takes its action. So in this case, look at the priority rule. It's 300. The allow is before the deny. Now, if I were to simply do this experiment with it, and flip these rules oops, and say instead of 310, I'm just going to make it just one little itty bitty number ahead of it, make it 299 and save it. Now I flip the rules. Now denies before allow, and you're exactly right, that priority number matters inside of here. Now that priority is not going to let that traffic in because it hits the deny rule first. And so when you start working with network security groups, it's really important that you understand how these are set up so you can start controlling your network traffic inside. So how do you become hard and crunchy on the inside of your network? My friends, Network Security Group is the answer. And this is just a quick example. You can have rules, priorities from rule priority 100 to priority 4096. So how many rules can you have? A whole bunch of rules inside of here to really govern traffic to be very, very specific about how this traffic flows inside the environments. Now, one thing I want to show you, and it's a little bit extra, I don't know if it's on the exam, but quite frankly, this is about skilling and teaching you. When you start working with network security groups, my friends, oh crud, how do I get around? How do I work with this? We actually have an amazing tool inside of Azure called the Network Watcher. So let me show you this tool. And if I go into Network Watcher, it's a troubleshooting diagnostic tool. Now it does a couple really cool things. Um, that I want to show you. Uh, one is effective security rules. And I'm not going to show you that because in my demo, I don't really have a lot. It would just repeat what you've already seen. But when you start working with a lot of network security groups and you have a lot of flow of traffic between virtual networks, well, what is the rule? I have these rules here, these rules here. I don't know what's going on. You can run the effective security rules and it's going to tell you what's going to happen. Now, let me show you three of my favorite things in this tool. And I just want to give you a quick overview. My first one is topology. Now, Garrett, I don't know about you. I've been asked to do network topology diagrams before. Isn't that a fun way to spend your day, isn't it? It's the most fun. Okay, so what I'm going to say, the sarcasm comes yeah, out, right? sorry. The cool <laughs> thing about this is that when you have these things, um, we can do it in Azure very quickly. Now, I'm not going to tell anybody what I'm about ready to show you. And folks, I'm not going to tell any of your bosses either, but watch what happens. So I'm going to say uh, my Windows group, I'm just going to select my AZ Fun group, and notice what happens here in a second, it automatically diagrams my virtual networks that are in that group. And by the way, all those icons are live links. So now I've just diagrammed, you can download it, throw your PowerPoint. I'll tell your bosses, it took you all day to do that, okay? So it's there, but it's easy to do. So we have that built into Azure. Learn how to use topology, see what's out there. Now we have two other tools. When we're, when we're on-prem and when we've been troubleshooting, what's the most common tool? We use ping. Hey, can I get there? I just want to send a simple pack and get a response. Inside of Azure, we have its equivalents called IP, IP Flow Verify. So when you start working with network security groups, you have to start how to understand how you troubleshoot it. So IP Flow Verify is a way I can essentially do it a ping at the Azure level. So I don't have to worry about diving into the virtual machines, what's the password, and hey, can I get from point A to point B when I have VMs involved? And the other one we have is called Nextop. This is the equivalent of trace route that we have inside of Azure as well. So folks, I don't know if this is on AZ900, I do know it's on every other exam after that. But from a standpoint, when you start working with network security groups, you have to know how to troubleshoot them. Network Watcher is one of those tools. And it does a whole lot else. I just show you some of my favorite things that are going to really help you uh, get through that. So understand we have some great tools to secure a network and we have some great tools to help you troubleshoot that flow. Can I get from point A to B? Did I effective rule? Did it deny me somewhere and I have to go look at it? And when you look at those network security groups, and this is where Garrett figured it out, when I looked at the network security group, if you notice the default rules, the very last rule that is created, and by the way, you can't get rid of the default rules, the very last rule 
is any, 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 deny. So it basically says, if you come up in the network security group and it doesn't know who you are, it doesn't know where you're trying to go, it hits that last rule, deny. I don't know who you are, see the last rule. But I really want to get in, see the last rule. But please, see the last rule. You're not on the list, you don't get in. All right, and that's why we have those rules there and in place. And pretty much everything that you make in our network security group is an exception to that very last rule, which is deny. I'm just going to allow traffic to come in or I'm going to deny and create some filters or some uniqueness that are here. I spent a little bit of time, folks. It is the, one of the biggest concepts we can do inside of Azure is that's the network security groups. So let's go ahead and switch back in and talk about some of the other great security stuff. I could spend all day in network security groups, but we got some stuff to talk about. Let's talk about some of the other tools and features we have built into Azure. First off, we have Security Center. Congratulations, everybody at Security Center at a basic level that's going to help do some analysis. It's a monitoring service that really looks at not only your Azure resources, but your also on-prem resources. And it provides recommendations based on how you configure this. In other words, a lot of people say, well, how would Microsoft secure us? The Security Center is our answer to that. It helps monitor that environment across both our clouds, our on-prem to see what's going on, and it'll apply your policies as you're provisioning them. So Security Center really helps look at that, but it also does a lot of things around detecting, assessing the issue, diagnosing it, giving you some kind of stabiliz uh, stabilization recommendations or best practices, and then closing it. They're incident response tools, so how we can find out what's going on in our environment, we can use Security Center to do that. We also have a thing called Key Vault. Now, Garrett, be honest with you. Have you ever forgotten your user ID and password? Oh, I've forgotten it many times. Yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> Sometimes we forget user ID and passwords. Now, have you ever forgotten your BitLocker key? Uh, I don't typically remember my BitLocker key. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, we don't know that. Yeah. Or we, we, it's stored in ours. It's stored in, in, in part of our Active Directory, although it's changed now. But folks, if you ever call Microsoft, and hey, I forgot my user ID and password, we generally will help you with that. We'll reset you. We, we can do a password reset for you. But if you call Microsoft and say, I forgot my encryption key, or I forgot my BitLocker key, or I put a little password on my Word document to password protect it, they're going to be sympathetic. They're going to say, I'm sorry, you don't know your key, but we can't help you because we don't know that. So when you get these important secrets and you get these important things like maybe a shared administrative password, you have to have a place to centralize, store it, and work with it. And this is what we use inside the Key Vault that we can leverage inside of here. So let me show you how this works. Oh, and, and side note, the Key Vault is also used programmatically. When your developers write code, they're going to want to be able to leverage certificate management, maybe a public and private secret, maybe a, a key pair, something. They're going to want to leverage it. Developers traditionally don't like to put this in their code. It, it adds bulk to their code. It adds a lot of extra latency they may not need. The great thing about this, the Key Vault can be accessed via APIs. So now our developers don't have to know the keys and the certificates. They just call the Key Vault whatever endpoints we give it to be able to leverage that. But let me show you an example of how the Key Vault can be used. So Garrett, I have, inside of my environment, I have a virtual machine I have logged on, and I've used Microsoft Azure's backup tool, and I want to recover some information from here. And so I'm just going to bring up my backup tool that we have. And if you've never used Azure Backup, it's actually a quite cool tool. It's out of the scope of this class, but it's really, really cool um, uh, to use and leverage. Now, for those of you looking at the tool, hey, that looks like Windows Backup. Yeah, it is. The only difference is, guess what? It's backing up to Azure. So I want to recover some data. And the first question it's going to ask, where did you actually create the data from? Well, inside of here, I created the data from another server. Um, so it's on another system. First thing it asked me, hey, what's your vault credentials? It's trying to verify my identity of who I am. So I'm going to go ahead and browse for this. I'm going to choose my vault credentials. And it tells me why recovery services vault, my subscriber ID, and all that information. Then it says which server in the vault, and these are all the different systems that I've backed up to this particular environment, it asked me my passphrase. I, I told you the passphrase before we started. You remember what I told you? I definitely don't remember it. You don't remember, right? No, but didn't you put it in your key vault? I did put it in my key vault. There I saw go. how to do it. And understand, folks, when you do these types of things, if I don't have this passphrase, guess what I don't get to do? Recover my data. I don't get to bring back that information. So all I did when I created the backup, and this happens when you configure it, it asks you for this passphrase. I, I can't remember what it is. So what I can do is go into my subscription, go into my key vault, and inside my key vault, I'll find my one that I have, and I have a couple of keys, and this is called a simple secret. So secrets are great for that common administrative password, um, that just generic environment, and this particular one is just my uh, this laptop here, 
and I'll drill into the actual key itself. So this is where the secret's stored. There's the endpoint that I have. And notice it has my secret value. I don't even have to know what it is. I can just simply copy this value, go back to my wizard, paste that in, and now I can begin. And the fact that I can get here tells me that it's going to work, and I'll be able to decrypt that data as I recover it. Now, I'm not going to do a full recovery operation, but that's how you might use Key Vault. Understand it's a place we can store those certificates, because unfortunately, anybody who's in the security industry and a lot of our companies in the world today have even turned down the government. Hey, do you have that key? And like, no, no, we don't have it. We don't know what it is. That's part of that shared responsibility. You have to know what those secrets are. The great thing about it, inside of Azure, you can leverage your key vaults for that. Now I know what you're thinking. Matt, wait a second. What if I forget my global administrative user ID and password for Azure, where my key vault key is, and I can't get to it? You can actually call Microsoft and get those global administrative passwords reset. Now, it's not as simple as like, Garrett can't call your company. Hey, I'm, I'm Garrett, I want to get your password. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of vetting that goes on when a global administrative password has to be reset. But especially for some of our smaller and medium customers where they might hire a partner that does work on their behalf, this does happen from time to time. Microsoft have facilities to make sure that they reset that password for the valid people, not the invalid folks that are there. So some really good things that'll happen inside of it. So let me go ahead and hop back in and let's finish some of the stories. So I just want to show you Key Vault and let's talk about some of the other tools that we can use inside of Azure. The first one is Azure Information Protection. It protects your information. <laughs> I know that seems kind of redundant of the, of the school of redundancy, but we've all done this. We, we've, we have information. How many of you on your, and I, Gary, I think you've done this before. You selected a little toolbar that says confidential. Mm -hmm. And what did it do when you, when you said it confidential? So it sets permissions on the message so that only certain people who are receiving the message are able to actually open it. Yeah, and that's done automatically in coverage. You set it manually, but everything, a lot of rules happen. That's Azure Information Protection. We're Microsoft, we are, we are using information protection, but we also can do it automatically. Let's say uh, Garrett sends an email that has uh, maybe a, a credit card number into it. We can actually automatically classify that as, 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 as super confidential, whatever it happens to be, and, or give Garrett a note, say, hey, look, you're putting a credit card information. Are you sure you want to do that? We can give them tips. And that's all information protection does. It helps label and uh, protect our documents. We can do it manually, or we can have it applied automatically. Then we also have advanced threat protection. Now look at this, solution for identifying and investigating threats, compromised identities and malicious insider actions. When I got to go to Hong Kong, threat protection kicked in. It basically said, wait a second, Matt, you, you're usually somewhere in the United States, what are you doing in Hong Kong? And it was flagged. And what happened is when I logged onto the hotel's network, I was forced to use multi-factor authentication. So we had conditional access tied with, oh, wait, something's not, not right here. The cool thing about this is that we can put sensors, not only inside of, uh, we use sensors inside of Azure, but we can put these on our on-prem domain controllers to monitor what's going on, to see what's going on inside the environment, to look at those types of things. And I like this one, it says malicious insider actions. So what is that? Basically, all of a sudden, I come in, I'm downloading a terabyte of data from the secure server. Well, I never ever done that. Alerts are going to happen. People are going to get notified. Wait, Matt's doing something he doesn't normally do. And we also have with threat protection, we have another variation of this called identity protection. It looks at the same things that are unique to me. Um, so for example, one of the things that identity protection does is Matt just logged on at eight o'clock in LA and one minute later logged in New York. Well, that's not possible. So we have that type of information stored inside of Azure. More importantly, behind both threat protection and identity protection is Azure Machine Learning Services. Looking at how you're doing it, looking at patterns, it's collecting data, so we know how you're doing these things. And when you think about how your users are, every user has a pattern on how they work with the systems. And we can get ahead of those potential threats if somebody gets compromised, well, listen, why is then, why is, then is Matt trying to break into the secure server? He doesn't have access. He never, he's never done it before. People are going to get notified, so you can help keep your environment safe and secure. Whew, lots of stuff in this module so far. And now we're getting to the big, big topic. You think, wait, Matt, you've talked about identity, you've talked about network security group, all these other things. Now let's talk about governance. For those of you that have children um, or people that you don't ask to do tasks or coworkers, um, or if you manage people, how many times have you ever asked somebody, and Garrett, how many times have you asked, I know you have kids, because we have five, I my, my three. How many times have you asked your kids to do something they did to the letter of law what you asked, but they didn't do it the way you would have done it. 
I would say that happens on a regular basis. They did it, and, you're, and you can't get mad at them. Because they got it done. Yeah, they, they found a loophole somewhere yes. in what you said to do. <laughs> they, you know, they said, hey, empty the trash on a day that ends in Y. And they waited, and they found a day that ends in Y, and did all these things. Well, inside of Azure, how do we control how folks do things inside of our environments? It's all around governance. And we have several things we're going to talk about inside of here. We're going to start with the conversation with policy. We're going to talk about role-based access control. We're going to talk about locks and everything in between. But now we start talking about if I give you access, if I authorize you to use Azure, are you going to create the virtual machines that I want you to create? We've gone through as IT and verified who they are, and we know which regions we want to use. How do I make sure you use the regions? Like, hey, you can only use Central, but you can't use South Africa. And we're going to have to create some Azure policies. Yeah, exactly right. We're going to have to create some Azure policies that are up here. And those are examples of policies. And all policies are, are our way as IT to govern what you, how you create things. Examples, virtual machine. You got to create a virtual machine of this family. You got to put it in this region. You have to put it in a tag. You have to have a public IP, or you can't have a public IP address. You have to use the hybrid benefit for licensing. All these policies, are designed to help us control how people create things inside of Azure. It's how we govern this. It's how we make sure they adhere to compliances that we may have inside the organization. Policies are extremely important because we control how users create stuff inside of Azure. Now, when you think about the policies, the examples I just laid out, region, VM, no IP, user licensing, very singular. And that's how you want to set them up because the tool inside of Azure for policy is going to flag, hey, this is not in compliance. Well, if you have a bunch of policies in a single policy file, you're going to have to figure out why they're not in compliance. So you keep them fairly siloed. But when you start working with Azure, how do you implement those policies? Well, after you create the definition file, you apply it, you assign it a scope, and you evaluate it to see what's going on. And policies have two effects. They can be audit policies, just to report, or they can have deny policies, which prevent users. So if Garrett were to try to create a policy in South Africa, and I'm preventing that region, he'll be denied. The resource will not be created, and it'll tell him why. You can't do those things. But when we start working with policies, when you start thinking about just virtual machine creation, and, and, and we talked about this in module two, and then we went through that wizard and all those settings, well, what if I was configuring all those, you know, 30, 40 settings that I can do? I wouldn't want to apply each one of those individually what you'll do is create a thing called an initiative. And all an initiative is a collection of policies. So the, the way this works, you create your, all your policies with all those individual settings, and, and they might be related, like I want to have a VM creation definition or an initiative. You put them all in that initiative, and then you apply that initiative to the scope you want to apply it. Remember our hierarchy from my, uh, module two? We have management groups, subscriptions, and resource groups. That's where we can assign our initiatives to and it makes it e very easy for us to control how users can create. So folks, you may be running this today. If you're using Azure in your organization and you can't create something in a certain region or you can't create a certain VM, very well, your IT department may have already implemented policies in your Azure. It's an okay thing because they're trying to govern how you control things. They might be for compliance. The best thing about this though, is if you can't do something that you need to do, you can go ask IT. Because IT wants you to use Azure. We want you to leverage it. They're going to, they want you to see inside of it. And you can say, hey, look, I need this VM. And then you can open up a dialogue of why that's important. And as long as it adheres to your compliance, these chances are they're going to give you a policy that lets you do those things. So policies and initiatives inside of Azure. Hey, Matt, uh, we just had a question come okay. in. Um, uh, this person is saying that they don't want the, they don't want the people in their uh, development team to stand up a really high powered VM with a lot of cores. Is this something that Azure policy can help us with? Oh, absolutely it can. That's where we can control those environments. Now, one of the reasons why, went, you know, if I'm thinking about that policy, for example, why they can't set up high powered, they're probably worried about costs. Because when you get into those really high powered machines, we're talking thousand dollar hour type of machines, lots of cores, lots of memory, you're in $2,000 a month, that kind of stuff that's there. So they're worried about costs, so we're going to prevent that. Now in module four, we're going to talk about what if we do need a bunch of those high-powered machines? How can we eliminate some of the costs to alleviate that? But generally speaking, whenever I want to control what people can or cannot do inside of Azure, guess what? I'm going to use policies to control that. And it's kind of like our, I would call our dad rule. You and I are dads, right? Hey, you got to do it, but now you got to do it the way I say you have to do it, right? And do it in the way that I want to. And that's what policies and initiatives do for us inside of Azure. That's what governance is inside of it. So policies are how we can create it, but can I even create it? 
am I allowed to use Azure, right? You know, I have to do it in a certain way with policy. Am I allowed to use it? And this is role-based access control. So role-based access control is how we do these things, folks, and it's fine-grained management. Now we apply it at the subscription level, the resource group level, or the individual resource level, and they allow us to govern our authorization. So understand, we authenticated against Azure Active Directory, proved we're allowed to be here. Now, what am I authorized to do? That's all done by role-based access control. It's how we grant permissions inside the organization. And generally how it works, you have your users, they're going to be in groups, and we assign those groups roles inside of Azure. And those roles under the covers have rights and permissions to do something. Depending on what role it is, is going to determine what you can actually do role-based access control, or RBAC for short. And so when we take a look at this, it's really straightforward. So I'm going to show you two examples in this uh, demo. I'm going to show you how it looks from a, an end user perspective, in other words, somebody that has RBAC being applied to them, and then how do we change it? So let me hop into my systems here. So I'm logged in uh, as admin two in this particular uh, tenant, and this tenant has a subscription assigned to it. This is the same tenant that I've been using in all of my demonstrations um, that I have, and I have lots of resource groups. As a matter of fact, we created a resource group for our VMs. If I go to resource groups, logged in as admin two, notice I only see the one resource group, RBAC test. What you're seeing here is role-based access control in action. Admin two only has permission in this one specific resource group. Even though I know there are more resource groups in the subscription, admin two hasn't been given permission yet. Even if Admin 2 knows how to get around it by going to create a resource, choose the VM and say, I know there's more, even in the dropdown list, they only show the one resource group that are there. So that's what it looks like from a perspective of a user that has RBAC applied to them. Now, how do I change it? So let me switch over to my other browser and I can actually show you how this works. So in my other environment, I'm going to go in and I'm going to go to the resource groups and notice I see all the resource groups. Now, in case you didn't believe I was in the same subscription, you see the RBAC test group that I'm here, but I have this AZ Fun group. So I want to give admin two permissions to use AZ Fun. And this is how it works, right? Traditionally speaking, when your organization uh, sets up an Azure subscription for consumption of Azure resources, the very next thing they're going to do is control who can create what and where they can create it. And generally they'll do it at a resource group. So if Garrett says, hey, I want to use some Azure, Great, Garrett, I'm going to give you a resource group, and I'm going to give you ownership of that resource group. You can do whatever you want inside that resource group, but I'm not going to let you govern up unless that's part of his role. Let me show you how this is set up. So I'm going to go into my resource group, and in my resource group, there's an option up here that's at the top. It says access control, and it says I am at the end. Um, I like I am. It stands for identity access management. When I think about role-based access control, it says I am so-and-so. Do you know who I am? Let me in, right? The kind of those types of things that we have. So I'm going to choose access control. And inside of here, I'm going to go role assignments. Now I see some legacy and I have some uh, things I've been doing a lot in this environment, but I have this RAID 78 account. Now this is a special account. This is my global administrators, the ID that I use for this particular environment. And they have this role assigned to them called user access administrator. All that role allows RAID 78 to do, and, and they're a global administrator, so they actually have a lot of other hidden rights and other things. Basically, global admin can do whatever they want, wherever they want inside the subscription but user access administrator has a very specific right. See this list of users that I have? This user can change that list and that's it. User access administration, controlling the access of the users that we have inside the environment. So let me go ahead and add in a role assignment. So I'm gonna say add a role assignment. It's gonna say, what role do you have? If I click on this down arrow folks, look at this. Now aside from the top three, owner, contributor, and reader, they're all in alphabetical order. And if you scroll through this list, like I get down to, uh, here's one that says backup reader, backup operator. This is very specific. It's giving me access to the backup service to be able to read, uh, I think in this case, the backup policies, just to be able to look at that information. Well, if I don't have anything backup related in this resource group, guess what this user can do? Effectively nothing. Even though they have the rights, it's for that particular service. The reason I point out these other roles is because sometimes when we think about role-based access control, we get siloed in thinking of just users and groups. But in reality, remember, we have Azure services running around Azure trying to access and use things. And we can really, once again, just like with network security groups, lock down the different types of roles that we want to use and leverage inside of Azure. 
but the three big roles at the top, and you'll see, you see owner, you see reader, you, you see contributor, you see all that stuff that's here. So it really starts with these three roles at the top, owner, contributor, and reader. The owner of the resource can do anything inside, in this specific case, it'll be anything inside of the AZ Fund resource group. That's my scope. They can do whatever they want. They can control the resources. They can even modify the access control list here in the screen. They can even control locks. They have full ownership over that. Then we have contributor. Contributor can do anything inside the resource group. They can add any resources, delete resources. They can do whatever they want as long as they have permissions on those resources inside that group. They do whatever they want. However, the contributor cannot change this list of access. Only the owner or the user access administrator can change the access list that we have here. And then we have reader. Pretty obvious what that one is. Reader is, they just look at the resources. That's all they can see what's going on inside of it. So I'm going to make my user owner. Now notice it says assign users to user groups. Remember I told you that there might be other resources. We actually have system managed identities. We have different Azure services. We have the ability to really control uh, how our users and our resources leverage the different resources in the resource groups or wherever we scope them to be. I'm going to leave on my user. I'm just going to go ahead and put an admin to, which should give me my user. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. And it'll take a second here, but now I have given admin to ownership of that resource group, which means now admin to, as I try to stall Garrett here and make sure and lengthen this out so it'll hopefully take place, because it doesn't always take place right away, but admin to will be given rights um, and roles to that user, that resource group. So if everything goes right, when I hop over there, I might have to do a quick refresh. Um, AZ Fund resource group should just show up for that user to use and leverage. So the great thing about this is that role-based access control, when you set it up, it, 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 it takes place immediately. You generally don't have to log off and log back in to make it work. And I may have to just as a refresh on the screens that are here. Notice as I'm keeping to stalling here, I'm trying to make sure this works. Um, so let me go ahead and switch over to my second browsing window here. And let me see if, if by chance AZ Fun has shown up. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to that now. And let me go into my in private group. All right, which says I was in the create virtual machine. So let's go to resource groups now. And look, it worked, my stall tactics work. There we go, a demo is live. Logged in as admin too, you see role-based access control. Now I have full ownership of that group. And that's how role-based access control works at a very high level. Remember, you take a user or group, you assign it a role, you, you find a scope, remember subscription, resource group or resource, and then you assign it a role. And under the covers, that role has rights and permissions. You can make your own roles if you want to. You can customize all of this. You have to do a little bit of work to make it happen, but it's actually pretty straightforward once you start working with those roles. So RBAC is a great way we control the authorization. So we authenticate against Active Directory. We use policy to say, this is how you have to create things. And then we use RBAC to say, can you create things? This is how it all starts to work together in a governance story. So let's go ahead and switch back. We got some even more security stuff to talk about. Um, we got one of my favorite topics coming up uh, right now, and that's resource locks. Oh, resource, I love me some resource locks because we talked about in module two, what happens when you delete a resource group? What happens to all the resources? They're deleted, they're gone forever. They're deleted, they're gone forever. They're, we don't back them up, so hope you have a backup. But we can put in place a free thing. By the way, resource locks don't cost you anything. There's no latency involved with them, but they do simple things. And we have two types of locks. Um, I didn't name these locks. We have a read lock, we have a, and a delete lock. Um, we have a new lock coming into our subscriptions as well as an update lock. But I'm going to focus on the two delete and le uh, read locks that we have inside of there. And let me take a look and to show you this, I just want to hop in because it's the best way to see how this works. Now remember, I'm logged in as my global administrator. So let me hop into my uh, subscription as my global administrator. And let me go into my resource groups. And typically what we do at the end of our classes that we teach, we're going to reach into this resource group and delete it. Now I'm the global administrator. RAID 78 is the global administrator. Folks, you just have to trust me, it's a global administrator. And I'm going to delete the resource group. So I'm going to go up here and say delete the resource group. And I'm a global administrator, so I don't actually type anything. I just copy and paste things. I'm just, I hear the laughter coming from afar. And I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. By the way, if you um, delete resource groups via script, you can put a, a no wait and a force script so you don't get this extra confirmation. Be very careful with that, right? The confirmations are there to help protect us from, well, quite frankly, us. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to delete this resource group. And notice it failed because it has been locked. Now, does this mean I can't delete this resource group? No, it simply means I can't delete this resource group while the lock is in place. 
as the owner of that resource or the global administrator, I can remove the lock and then I can reach in and delete the group. But you have to remove the lock first. It's something you have to explicitly add and something you have to explicitly remove inside the environments. Now, where did I set this up? I set this up inside my locks. So if I go to locks, you'll see the lock for that resource group. There's the can't, uh, the can't delete, which is the delete lock, but I also have this one for read only, but notice the scope. I put it on fun VM2 is where I put the scope, but it's read only. Now the read only lock is another special type of lock we have, and it's actually very specific. It's actually even more restrictive. It does everything the delete lock does, but it also marks the resources as read only. And this is where I want to be very clear. It marks them read only from an Azure perspective. In other words, I put this on a VM that's currently running. Let me show you what this does. So let me hop into that VM. And this has a read only lock inside of it. And I'm just going to try to stop it. It's currently running. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop that VM. It's going to say, are you sure? Yep. And it's not going to let me stop it. Why? I'm changing its Azure property. So anything inside of here is read only. It means I can't start or stop that VM. But what it doesn't mean, I can't change things inside the VM. That doesn't mean that. So it means what do I can do? I can't do anything inside of Azure. I can't resize it. I can't stop it. I can't start it. I can't change anything about the properties of this VM, but I can still reach into the VM and change properties inside of it. So I can modify configuration files, add documents. I can work with things. And so when you use the read-only locks, be very careful with them. They're very restrictive because they deny changing of properties. Now, when you think about this, why might I use a read-only lock in conjunction of an environment? I use a VM just to show you a quick example, but chances are in your resource group, and by the way, when you apply a lock at a resource group, it automatically applies to all the resources below it. Well, why would I put a read-only lock? Well, maybe you have a public IP address there, or you have a, a configuration that you don't want to change. Mark those as read-only. Let people look at them, but don't let anybody change it because that could impact your entire application. So these locks are greatly important. Understand how they work, especially for your exam. And you're going to see these, once again, pretty much on every exam from here on out, even on the architecture exams. Resource locks are incredibly important to help protect our resources. Now, folks, when we start thinking about this, when we start thinking about how this works, why I can't do something inside of Azure, we talked about security from a layered approach you also have to think about troubleshooting from a layered approach. If I can't change a resource, what could it be? Now your brain's heavy on locks right now because we just got done talking about it. Well, if you can't change a resource, oh, I have a read-only lock. Well, that's not the only way. Is there RBAC control? Do I have permission to change it? Have I been authorized to change it? Oh, yeah, maybe. And then the other one is, do you have network access to that resource you're trying to change? Is there an NSG? So you have to start thinking about security in a layered approach, not only how you approach it, but also how you troubleshoot it. It's the old, age old adage, check the least common denominator, find what's going on. Um, how many of you are, and I, I don't know if you ever did this, Garrett, I know I did it. Um, how many ever messed with somebody's system and you wiggled the RJ45 cable just outside of the network? So it wasn't making that connection, they, they drove them nuts because they can figure out what's going on. Or you did it to somebody's mouse, you wiggled out the USB, just so it looked like it was going there, they can't move their mouse or take change the ball battery. out of the bottom. Take the ball out of the bottom, exactly <laughs> right. Understand their layered approaches here. So when we start approaching the security and all the stuff that we're giving you and that once again, just kind of giving you an inch deep and a mile wide, the security stuff, start to understand we have to start thinking about troubleshooting and how do we move around. That's why I show you Network Watcher. That's why I show you where to find all this stuff in the portal. So let me switch back. Got a few more things to cover off in this module inside of Azure. Um, blueprints. Blueprints are actually pretty cool as well. So when you start thinking about all the stuff that we can create inside of Azure, we have role-based access policy, we have role-based access control, we have policies, we have templates. When I give somebody a subscription, how do I give them something that's kind of pre-canned, like the, the Betty Crocker Easy Bake Oven? Here you go, boom, there's your cookies, right? How can I do that? Blueprints are my way I can do that. It allows me to combine templates, policies, um, my DevOps stuff and put it into one basic big giant blueprint and I can give you a subscription with already resources deployed and that's what blueprints do at a real high level. But we also have subscription governance. So how do we control uh, the different things? We can control billing and chargeback. That's going to be done with uh, most likely tags. We have access control at the deployment level. Um, when we look at subscriptions though, we can use subscriptions as a government level. So I can say, okay, here's subscription for my development environment, here's subscription for my production environment. There are access boundaries. We can also set different limits on different subscriptions. So we can control how people work with those. More importantly, even at Microsoft, 
we have limits inside of what you can initially use inside of a subscription. Now, don't worry, even though you might run into those limits occasionally, you can make a simple request to Microsoft and get those limits increased. Hey, I need more in virtual networks or I need more resources for virtual machines. We oftentimes will grant those requests if they're within reason. And, and by the way, when I say within reason, you say, hey, I need a thousand more, that's within reason that we have. Um, and in my entire career, I've only seen, uh, working with Azure past the six or seven years, I've only seen a denial once. And it wasn't technically a hard denial, it was a very soft denial, it was like, look, and it basically amounted to when you read the email, we, we, we can't give it to you just yet. The, the data center's in renovation, we're doing some remodeling basically. They were adding resources to the data center. It's like, look, we can't do it now. If you need it now, you're going to have to use another region. But guess what? In a couple months we can do this. So it wasn't a hard no. And we normally will let those uh, resource limits be there. Now, how do you know if all this stuff is working? Monitoring and report. We talked about tags. That's how we can control or organize our resources. They're basically a key uh, name value pair. Hey, I want to, this is called the region tag and you have to have the value West region. And that's how we work with it. Or this is your department tag and it's the you know, whatever finance department. The main reason we use tags is for billing because we want to be able to make sure how to charge back to the different departments and organization. Understand when you get a bill from Microsoft, Essentially, it's just a really big spreadsheet with line item after line item, line item all the resources you're creating, but there's also a column that's specified for tags. And the great thing about those tags, guess what? We can now can organize that and secure it and we can actually understand it. We also might use tags for a project. Like I have a tag for, what's your project name? Project X. Now I can understand how much does that project cost me. I can just do a simple query on tags. It also makes it very easy to find all the resources that might have that tag associated with it. So tags are an organizational unit as much as they are uh, a billing purpose as well. We have Azure Monitor. Folks, this is a two hour module in and of itself in one of our courses on monitoring. And what monitoring allows us to do is look at data and we can collect not only the metrics of things, uh, this is running at 85%, but we can also collect the logs of things. Why is it running at 85%? So the monitoring is really a platform that includes our log analytics. It helps us collect data. And the minute you start working with this, the monitor's in place, it's already starting to find that telemetry. It's already start to work. The minute you start putting things inside of Azure, you have the monitoring. We can look at uh, the different applications. We even have the ability with monitoring folks, we have a thing called Azure Application Insights, which is a part of our monitoring platform that can reach into code and say, you know what? That line of code is why your application's slow. Here's what we're seeing from that. It can tell you those specifics. It can help you respond to alerts. What happens here? Think about this. I have a monitor, I'm looking at stuff. I've set a, a set of condition. Say, if I reach over this, a uh, certain resource parameter, so a condition and a resource, I'm, I'm monitoring all that. I can create a thing called an action group inside of Azure. And what the action group does, allows me to do things. Now, what kind of things are in the action group? Oh, you can send emails, you can send text, um, you can run Azure Functions, Azure App Services, you can do scripts. Pretty much when I have an alert that is triggered by our monitoring, we can pretty much do whatever we want to help maintain or remediate or fix or do whatever we need to. So I talked about in module two, when you want to scale up a resource, like a virtual machine, you want to add more hardware to it because it's at capacity or need more CPU or you're measuring the monitoring, that's a manual process. It's actually really easy to do inside of Azure. Say, you know what? That's, that, that system's at CPU is 85%. We need to get another uh, bigger VM. And what we'll do inside of Azure is reach in, alert triggers the monitor. We have an action group that runs a script that increases the size of that VM automatically. So you can automate a lot of this stuff. Or we can monitor, hey, the VM's off at, at uh, 6 a.m. on Monday, turn it on. That's part of the things that we can work with inside of a monitoring environment. So we can monitor our health. Now, how do you know when you're looking at things, if Azure's running slow or poker or something is not right, how do you know if it's what you're doing inside of Azure versus is Microsoft having a problem, something's wrong inside of Azure? So we use monitor to see what's going on inside your subscription, but we use Azure Service Health. It's our way of Microsoft to communicate with you you know what, there might be an issue inside of your subscription, there might be an issue in all of Azure that might impact all the regions, it might impact a region you have stuff in, but we are actually do this with what's called service health and allows us to look at those different dynamics inside of Azure. We can look at all the health of our services and you can filter on it just for the regions you have stuff. It's our way at Microsoft to say, hey, something happened. And when there are service health issues inside of Azure, 
We'll not only tell you the status of the issue, is it currently being actively worked, has it been resolved, has it been remediated, we'll also share with you, as long as we don't violate any compliances in this process, the root cause analysis. So one of the things that we had happened, we had a 19 hour outage, by the way, a really bad outage a, a little while back in one of our, our South Central Data Center. And when you led the root cause analysis, it pretty much led with, the facility is hit by multiple lightning strikes. And everybody thinks I'm disclosing some kind of Microsoft secret. No, it was in the public root cause analysis document that every Azure customers can look at. And even folks, you can, even if you're not a customer, you have to go and figure that out in the news wires that are out there. But we publish this stuff. We want to be open and transparent with you about how we actually use our Azure environments inside of here. So service health. We also have Azure Advisor. Now Azure Advisor is free. It's a free tool that runs across your environments and say, hey, Based on what I see, you may want to do something. This is Microsoft, what I like to call Microsoft's best recommendations tool. In other words, customers ask us all the time, how would Microsoft do this? Advisor is a free tool that will help you do all this. It's going to identify things inside of Azure. It's saying, hey, you can do this a little bit better. You can do this a little better. You can improve the resources here. Azure Advisor is going to help you do things according to what Microsoft considers best practices. My advice to you when you look at Advisor, take a look at the advice it gives you, but take that advice with a grain of salt. Make sure that whatever actions it is, is uh, asking you to do, it doesn't violate any internal compliances. And so you actually can work with that information. And it's a down the middle tool. I have had customers say, hey, this is Microsoft's upsell tool. It's always trying to get me to do other things and best practices. And we are going to say, hey, look, you have a single VM. Have you thought about having an availability set, which means you have to spin up, spin up another VM, which means it's going to cost you more money, but we're going to give you that recommendation. It's up to you whether you want to take it. But the tool will also go the other way. Say, you know what, that VM you're running is only at 25% utilization. Have you considered using a smaller VM that costs you less and will help you save money? So Advisor is a free tool to allow us to do those types of things very easily inside of Azure. Oh, the last topic, privacy compliance and data protection standards. So we have a lot of stuff here but really everything centers around, and say it with me, Garrett, Trust Center. Trust Center. Trust Center. Trust Center. All right, Trust Center. <laughs> so whenever a customer asks us, hey, what Microsoft compliances do you have? What's your privacy statement? What are your standards around data protection? How does Microsoft as a business? We want to be your trusted IT provider. We want to have you trust in our cloud. Whenever you have this, you can just simply pull up Bing and do Azure Trust Center and it's a website, and I'm going to show it to you here in a moment where all this information is stored. It's all our compliancy terms and requirements. We share with you. You can even download the auto reports for most of these compliancies to find out how our cloud is verified. And by the way, we don't verify these ourselves. These are all third party uh, organizations that come in and vet us. Just like you have to get vetted when you have compliancy, we have to adhere to the same standards you do inside of it. And we have HIPAA compliance. We have uh, GDPR is built into our DNA. It's been that way as well. And if you ever get a chance, if you go to any one of our conferences, our customer uh, conferences that we have, if you get a chance and if compliance and trust is important to you, all I have to say is if you see Brad Smith speaking anywhere, and I, he's our chief legal officer, I just call him the head legal dude, but he's our big lawyer in the sky at Microsoft, his number one concern, open and transparent communication to his customers. And folks, if you want to hear somebody that's a really good speaker talking about this at a level of our company, go see Brad Smith. Yeah, and even if you don't get an opportunity to actually go out and see Brad uh, in a, at a conference or whatnot, uh, Brad has a blog and he is very actively posting on his blog about all the different things that Microsoft is doing to really protect your data. Because when Microsoft thinks about data, the data is yours. You're entrusting us to store the data for you, but that's not our data, that belongs to you. And we will go to bat for you to help protect that data. And Brad loves to post about that. So I highly recommend checking out his blog. Yeah, he's an amazing resource that we have. He lives and breathes us every day. Our privacy statement's up there. We have our trust center. You know what, let me hop out and let me show you what the trust center is, where you can find it. And literally folks, it's as easy as just doing a quick search on the internet and saying, let's go Azure Trust Center. And this is what it's going to look like when you come to the site. Um, and we change this frequently. So depending on when you actually do the search, it may have a different splash screen or what's on, but you can see the investments that we're making in R&D. Um, we have cybersecurity experts employed by our company. We even have, you know, I talk about them in the dream job now. I think my other favorite dream job, we have a red and blue team inside of Microsoft. We actually have internal Microsoft employees that every day they wake up 
trying to defeat each other. They try to break in and we have defenders. I mean, we have this type of stuff. We, we think about this. And we talk about Brad Smith, another one, and he's the father of Azure, Mark Rusinovich. If you ever get a chance to hear him talk, especially if you're looking where our future of our cloud is going, once again, hugely entertaining, hugely smart dude that we have um, inside of here. But we also have compliance offerings. Now, I like this one because I get asked this all the time. What does Microsoft have around compliance? So if I say learn about compliance offerings, we can actually come in and take a look at all the compliances we offer as an organization. We lead the industry in this. Now, when I say that, I always smile because generally once we get a compliancy, people will follow along because cloud technologies have to be treated differently, but everything we do is vetted here. It's all approved and verified for us to see. The cool thing about this is that we can look at all these compliance standards. We can see what's inside of there. The other word of uh, note here is if a new compliancy comes out, Microsoft may or may not have that compliancy on our roadmap, but it takes time to get these compliance. It might take months. If a new compliancy comes out, don't expect Microsoft or really any cloud provider, oh, the new compliance came out yesterday, we're going to have it tomorrow. No, that's not how it works inside of here. Let's go ahead and take a look at one, uh, the International Traffic and Arms Regulation, or ITAR. And if I look at it, it gives you an overview of what the compliance is, talks about how Microsoft's looking at it, and it tells you what in scope services we have. This is very, very important. Just because we say Azure has ITAR does not mean all of Azure has ITAR. And specifically in this one, it says Azure government. That means only the customers in our Azure government uh, environment can use this. It's only, by the way, it's really the only ones it applies to. But if I open this up, it's going to come up with a document saying, hey, an overview of Microsoft compliancy, and it has a document for you to look at. I'm going to go ahead and just agree to that to download this. And I want to show you what this is, because when you start using Azure, if compliancy is important to you, you have to understand not only what compliance offerings we have, but you also have to know this document. We update this document frequently, but it'll tell you the different compliances that we have here. And as I scroll this, here's ITAR. So I just click on ITAR and it tells me what it is and gives me what services scopes. And it says, see Azure services and FedRAMP and DOD SRG audit scope. These are all a part of it. Now, where's all that information? Now I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom of this document, dun, 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 go all the way bottom and look at the table we have. So just because we say we have a compliance for Azure government, doesn't mean all the services inside of Azure have that as well. Now, you'll notice there's a lot of checks, which means generally we do try to certify everything, but sometimes a service doesn't meet those standards or it's not going to be using those standards. Understand what compliance is important to you. You have to understand these compliance offerings and what we can do. So even before you start to design a solution, if you have a certain governmental compliance that you have to adhere to, do a quick research, check this document to make sure the stuff you're going to use falls in compliance. Now we also have another tool called the Compliance Manager. It's one of the few demos we can't do with our subscriptions that we have here, but it'll actually run across your Azure environment and tell you what compliances you're hearing. Hey, I'm looking for this compliance, do I meet that? It's going to basically do that fact check, pull out this table and check all that information for you. So we have ways to look at the compliance offerings inside of Azure. Now, the one thing I want to show you, because I mentioned it, um, let me hop back into my, uh, my system and let me just show you Advisor real quick. I just want to show you what's there. So I'm just going to do a quick search on Advisor. I know it's a top result. And Advisor comes across and looks at recommendations. And notice I have a recommendation for high availability. I have a recommendation for operational excellence and it's still checking for performance, security, and cost. We'll see if it comes up with anything here in a second. This is that free tool that's going to give me ideas. So I'm doing well in security, performance is all right, cost is all right. If I say, let's look at the recommendations for high availability, it's going to say, hey, look, you might want to enable a virtual machine backup. You might want to use availability sets. So it's telling me some information. And if I click on, uh, let's use availability sets because we talked about it in this course, it's going to say, talk about moving mean. And by say, it says moving machine to an availability set. This is where I got excited the first time I saw this. It's an export and an import operation. It'll lead you through those steps. But if I go back to the advisor and I go to operational excellence, Notice it says, create a service health alert. This one is saying, hey, look, we, we, don't, we, we advertise this and you can look for our Azure service health if something happened, but this is saying, you know what? Why don't you create an alert? So if a, a service health issue impacts your Azure environment, from a Microsoft perspective, you get a notification on this. And let me show you what this looks like because what I'm going to dig into here is actually the monitoring platform for just a second. It tells me here's what my target is and what I want to do. And I can simply create an action group. So we'll just call this creative name test, short name test. And what are the actions? And we'll say email. And what I can do is set the action type. I can set emails. I can do IT service management. I can run a logic app. I can also do automation runbook, which is our scripting environment. So if I go just email, 
It then says, what do you want to send an email to? What do you want to send an SMS to? You want push notifications? You want a voicemail? This is all that alerting environment does. So this is the tip of the iceberg for monitoring, but when you start thinking about, hey, we monitor for condition, and I want to be alerted here how it's going to go, and those actions, you can have, have an email and do an action group, an automation script, then run a web function. You can put whatever you want inside the action group. So I just want to show that to you briefly because we were out here uh, in the portal. So let me dig back up and we'll close out module three inside of our environments today. And what I want to close out with is just a couple special notes. And I've already mentioned it a few times. We have two things in Azure that are, we have Azure and, and the Azure that you've been seeing today is what I call Azure commercial. It's what probably 90% of all of our customers use. It's most likely the customers you're going to use, uh, what you're going to use inside of Azure. It's kind of our public environment of Azure. But we have a couple of special, what are called community clouds, very siloed focus. The first one we have is Azure Government Services. It's specifically designed for US agencies and their contractors where they do things in a very special version of Azure. Matter of fact, physically they are separate regions, they're separate data centers, they're even treated differently. They're very different than our actual public uh, Azure environment, a commercial environment designed specifically for government compliance. And they adhere to all the government standards, especially when it comes to data center maintenance, logistic management, compliance, these are, are abundant there at the government resources. I can't use the government uh, a cloud. You may not be able to use the government cloud. Why? You have to go through a vetting process. You have to be screened and authorized. But some of our customers that have both a public side of a business, like some of our airline companies and some of our manufacturers, they have a public side of the business, but they also have government contracts. Sometimes some of those organizations will span both. They'll be in the Azure commercial for their commercial side of their business, and they'll be in Azure government for their government side of the business. So we have the ability to support those clouds, but they are separate clouds. They can't cross information between, they're treated completely separate. We also have a special cloud in adherence with the Chinese government rules and regulations. It's called Azure China. Um, to access to this, you have to access it via 21 Vianet. And the reason we chose uh, 21 Vianet is simply because we want to make sure that the cloud is operated by a provider that is in, in compliance. So we chose 21 Vianet because they met all the Chinese uh, government regulations to work with that. So on your exam, understand we have Azure Commercial, we have Azure Government, and we have Azure China accessed via 21 Vianet. Wow, that was a whirlwind. We talked about all the things in security. We covered you know, network security groups, identity and access, locks, governance, identity protection, and then we ended up with compliance and we just got done talking about uh, China and government cloud services. So as you can see folks, there's a lot of stuff around security, privacy, compliance, and trust. And that brings us to the end of module three.
Let's go ahead and get started with Azure Fundamentals Module 4, Pricing and Support. Now, you might be thinking, wait a second, Matt, I'm never ever going to buy Azure. It's already been bought and they already have a sort agreement. Why do I have to have this? Folks, I will be honest with you that a lot of things in this module you may not have to use, but I am going to show you some resources, the calculator, the free services, things that you might use in your day-to-day -day job, especially if you build projects in Azure, you're going to have to know how to estimate it. So inside this section, we're going to talk about all those key things that govern cost, our subscriptions. We'll talk about service level agreements, especially when you use more than one Azure service, you have to understand how to com uh, combine what is, uh, create what is called a composite SLA, so you know what the support is that Microsoft's going to give you for that solution that uses multiple services. So let's take a look and hop right in and start with the first one, subscriptions. That's where you get your stuff done. It's how we provide billing and access boundaries for our customers and, and for folks like yourselves. We have an account can have multiple subscriptions. So generally what we see is most customers have one Azure Active Directory tenant and they have all the subscriptions for Azure underneath it. Now, one just special note about that, Azure sub subscriptions is one type of subscription we have. We have Office 365, we have Dynamics 365, they're all different subscriptions that can be tied to that one tenant. Oftentimes with most customers, we have one user ID tied to multiple subscriptions. We organize those subscriptions with a concept called management groups. And you go up to six levels of depth in management groups, but they allow us to control the flow of our policies and some of our security. So when we looked at Azure policy in module three, we got to see how we can work with those different things and we can inherit conditions. It's how we organize when we have multiple subscriptions because most customers that we work with have lots of subscriptions. A lot of our enterprise customers have hundreds of subscriptions. Well, how do we manage from a cost perspective, a policy perspective, we use management groups because it's one of the scopes that we can apply those policies at. When we look at our subscription offers, what types of things do we have? Well, we have a free subscription, believe it or not, and I'll show you how to access that in just a moment, but we have pay as you go. I like to call this the full retail price. In other words, you got really bored one day, it was 2, 2 a.m. in the morning, you pulled out your credit card and said, I want some Azure. It's full retail pricing, it's pay as you go, and that's full, uh, full price. But we also have an enterprise agreement. Some of my enterprise customers that may be listening right now, you probably have an EA for your organization. And what that is, you've signed up to commit to spend so much in Azure over a three to three year period of time. And based on that commitment level, you get a discount. So your prices are less inside of it. We have a student subscription. When you think about these different types of subscription offerings, they dictate price, but inside of an organization, you can have multiple ways that you acquire Azure for your organization. Now, most businesses will be in an enterprise agreement. Why? It's a great way that we can catalog, get a discount, and work with the environment. But we do have free services. You have the ability to test Azure for 12 months um, or a $200 credit that allows you to explore Azure. You can also look at these things for 30, um, uh, 12 months for popular service, 30 days for other services, and there's a bunch of other stuff that's free. Now, at the end of the trial, you will have the choice to upgrade as pay as you go. Now, folks, when you look at Azure free accounts, when you sign up for the first time, it's going to ask you for a credit card information. And really that's to prove that you're a human, that you belong. It's not going to charge your card unless you explicitly say, I want to move from a trial to pay as you go pricing. And then that's when your card will start being billed. Now also a special note, the subscription that I use for a lot of the demonstrations and as I teach and learn is I use my uh, Visual Studio subscription. So if you are a developer and you have an MS, a former MSDN and Visual Studio subscription, you actually have monthly benefits. So I have a Visual Studio Ultimate subscription. I get $150 every month to work inside of Azure. So there's lots of ways to get and use in Azure, but understand my subscription is all by itself. It cannot be combined with other subscriptions designed specifically for dev and test purposes. In my case, I happen to use it to teach. So what I want to do is I want to hop in the portal and show you where the free services are. So let me go ahead and switch into the portal. And in my portal, I'm just going to do a quick search for free services. And I type in free and just go ahead and open it up. And it tells me how to get the 12 month uh, with free Azure account, it tells me what I get for 12 months for free. But as I scroll down, I want to point out something here that's really nice. Always free re services. Folks, now I tell you that most of your businesses, you're not going to run in the always free services category, but I like to show this because you might work for nonprofits or small community environments where they need just a little bit of computing power or a little bit of horsepower. You might be able to do that for free inside of Azure. So research these, especially if you're involved in some of those committees outside of work. I'm telling you what folks, it's a really good way uh, to work in Azure. And if you don't, guess what? 
this is a good way to kind of kick the tires. See what's there. You have all kinds of technology you can kind of explore and research and leverage inside of Azure. So you definitely want to take a look at those free services. Not a lot of folks know that they're there, but they've always been there. They've always been there for us to use and leverage. We have our free services. So let's go ahead and switch back. Just wanted to show that to you real quick. And inside of Azure, we took a look at our free services, but now let's talk about how to plan and manage costs. And I know I hear the yawns, but folks, you have to understand how you're billed. And first off, how is pricing and purchasing determined? Well, under the covers, we have this little concept called a usage meter. Now, if you're thinking like, hey, is that like my meter, my electric meter or my water meter? Yeah, exactly it is. Whenever you start to work with Azure resources, the meter starts to spin. Well, how fast does it spin? What's my price? Well, it depends. It depends on what type of customer are you? Are you an enterprise customer and have an EA with a discounted rate, which means it changed how that usage meter spins? Or are you a cloud solution provider, a CSP? This is generally for our mid-sized to smaller organizations where they hire a partner come in uh, to, to build those solutions in Azure on their behalf. And sometimes those partners will have discounts. So that can control the price. Then we also have the web direct or the pay as you go. That's the, basically the full retail price of Azure. So it depends on how you acquire your subscription is going to control your price. But we also have other factors that come, uh, come into play. What type of resource? Every resource inside of Azure um, has different price points. And also we have different types of services that are basic services, that are premium services, that are standard service. Those all dictate that. And then we also have the ever popular location, location, location. What region you put that stuff in matters as well. There's lots of factors that come into that pricing and purchasing. And when we look at Azure, you have to understand this. When you start sending resources up, how do we calculate that? So knowing where your stuff is, knowing how you acquire that is going to determine what your bill is going to be. Now we also have uh, charges uh, for zones and we have different billing zones. Now really, the main reason we have these zones are for bandwidth purposes. We've, we've talked about in some of the modules, um, modules two specifically, we talked about egress traffic charges. When we have charges that go outside, when we have outbound data transfer, it's all dictated by the different zones that we have. And these billing zones control that uh, environment based on that pricing for outbound data transfers. And really, you'll see this in the calculator when you're working with these. And generally speaking, the zones are, are, are kind of a higher level abstract for billing, uh, higher than the geographies that we have inside of Azure. How do you estimate costs? Remember, we talked one of the benefits of cloud and one of the terms we did in module one, predictive cost. Well, how do I predict my cost? We actually have a pricing calculator that'll allow you to come in and see what those price resources. I'm going to show this to you in just a moment so I can show you how it works and how the different pivots and switches and how we can control costs and see what's there. And I'm going to show you how to save a lot of money on a virtual machine without having to change what you actually get. So let's take a look at that calculator right now. So let me switch into the calculator. And in my pricing calculator, and let me clear out my calculator because I've done this a few times. We have the ability to come in here and do any of the services that we want. We have compute, we can look at networking, we can look at storage. Pretty much every service inside of Azure has the ability to have a calculator for it. So I'm just going to go up to the feature because I want to use virtual machines because they do such a good example that's here. Now folks, if you're going to build something in Azure, I'm willing to bet somebody's going to ask you, how much is this going to cost me? Well, you're going to have to know how to use the calculator. So here I am in the calculator. I'm just going to go to virtual machines and it's going to add it to my calculator here. And notice that, and I'm going to kind of treat, kind of keep this, uh, pay attention to this little number. Right now we're at $150.62 a month for this virtual machine, which is a D2 V3 uh, virtual machine. Um, it's currently running Windows. Now bear in mind, the cost of this v a virtual machine um, has not only what operating system you have, but also what type of virtual machine we have. So this is Windows. What if I want to run Linux, which doesn't have a licensing cost? Notice what happens to the price. Now it's down to $85. Same virtual machine, but now we don't have to pay that licensing. So when you work with these environments, when you have this, you're buying the license for that. Linux and Ubuntu and CentOS, they don't have licenses, but we have the ability to work with that. But also location matters. Notice I'm in West US. Well, let's go to the newer uh, version of West. Let's go to West 2 and notice what happens. That price goes down to 137. Why? West 2 is a neuter data center. It's more efficient. Remember, economies of scale, we pass those savings on to you as our customers, even in the US. I don't know, uh, Garrett, pick a region for me. Uh, let's go East US. East US. East US is 137, East 2, also 137. Let's go Japanese, let's go to the Far East. Um, 161 for that same VM. Let's go to India, 
173. So different locations in different regions. So folks, as you're moving this environment around, understand that the location matters. The location of where we put the resources and why might you choose one region or another? Well, global, uh, global REITs and latency are going to factor in, put your regions close to the resources you're going to consume. But if you, if you really don't care, pick the one that's going to save you some money inside of it. So I'll go back to West, so we're back to our 152. Now, remember, this is for the Windows system. What if I want to have some SQL with it? Now, understand what I'm getting ready to do, because you're going to see the number jump quite significantly, because we think you want to buy SQL Enterprise. When I choose SQL here, it's not, not that I'm going to run SQL on top of this. This means I'm buying a Windows Server with a brand new Windows license and a brand new SQL license that I have. And this means I'm going to pay for not only the virtual machine, but also the SQL license. And in this case, it defaults to Enterprise. So I went from 152 to 1200, a little over $1,200. That's a pretty significant jump. Jump. Well, I don't want to use enterprise. Maybe I go down to web and that price goes into it. What are you buying a brand new license? Now folks, a lot of your organizations have bought SQL under what is called software assurance or SA. If you've bought SQL for your organization with SA, you have what is called license mobility. What does that mean? You can bring that license with you inside of Azure. Now you can't build it by adding in SQL, uh, putting SQL in the image that you pull from the marketplace. You'll build a Windows server install SQL separately and apply your license to that. And you won't have to pay that cost inside of here. So I'm going to turn off SQL here. We have the different type of tier. I have standard and I have one called low priority. And low priority machines are basically our way of saying, okay, you know what? I'd like to have five servers always, but I'd like to have 10 just to have. Well, you can buy 10, you know, five additional low priority servers, but if Azure needs that capacity for whatever reason, we're going to take those servers away from you. But to do that, we give you a price discount on those machines. So normally what we'll see is we'll see five folks, hey, I have five servers running the full price, don't ever touch them, and then I have five running low priority, which are called spot instances that Azure can take back if it needs capacity. And because you do that, you get a discounted rate. And uh, choose standard. By the way, basic here are the real minimal servers. There are A-level servers, and we're talking like, you know, a, a quarter of a, a gig of RAM, real small, single purpose machines. I'm just going to leave it on standard. Now the type of machine matters here. So I'm West US Windows, still 152, I'm a D2 V3, and let me just hop down to a D4, which is the one right below it, that's $300 a month. Uh, let's hop down uh, to D16, or D32 here, $2,000. What are you difference here? How many CPUs, how much gig of RAM, what type of hardware are you looking at? Now folks, you're looking at that number, I know what you're thinking. Wait a second, $2,000 a month, are you nuts, Matt? Remember, total cost matters here. This is just for the hardware. And if you're just thinking that, then yeah, Azure may be more expensive than what you're used to seeing. But bear in mind, you have to look at the total cost. How much would it look and create if you were to have the total power, heating, cooling, the IT management for that system on-prem? You have to look at the total cost of ownership. And I'll show you, we have a calculator to help you figure that out as well. So let me go back to my D2V3, $150 a month. Okay, it seems reasonable. But now we have to get a little specialized in licensing. Now folks, I had a choice when I joined Microsoft 19 years ago. I could go down the technical path or I could go down some of the licensing paths. Our licensings can be complex. And I'm not asking anybody on this, uh, listening to this to be a licensing expert, but you want to be smart of how you purchase Azure and what you can do to leverage licenses you may already have, but also how you can prepay some of this. So one of the concepts we have inside of Azure is called a reservation. And what this allows us to do is simply say, you know what, I'm going to prepay for this me machine um, and I'm going to pray for so many instances of this. So after you've done your proof of concept and say, you know what, the D2 V3 machine that I have can solve my problem and I need 10 of them. Well, in Azure, you can say, you know what, I'm going to buy 10 of them as a reserve instance and I'm going to prepay for them for three years. And if you choose a prepay for that VM, we'll charge you, by the way, this can be an installment, so you don't have to pay it in one big lump sum, and that's actually relatively new. But we have the ability to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to use these 10 VMs at a D2 V3. Now the reservation is a subscription property. So we apply this to our subscription and whenever we spin up a D2 V3 machine, Azure automatically applies a discount. In other words, your folks don't have, oh, okay, I got to make a reserve instance. No, no, you apply it to the subscription level, then that reservation property seeps through the entire subscription for you automatically. And since you've only prepaid for 10, well, what happens when I get to the 11th virtual machine? It'll go back to that $150 a month. Now bear in mind, same VM, I'm just prepaying because I know I'm going to use it. Now I'm down to $104 a month for that same VM. Hey Matt, I've got a question for you. So we talk about reservations and they sound like they're a great way for us to potentially be saving money. Now, 
let's say I prepay for a three-year reservation. That's what you've got selected there. Yep. And I decide I've got this three years and I want to I want to prepay for this, but then a year and a half in, I realize that I need to upgrade because I need more powerful virtual machines. Am I locked in for the full three years or is there something I can do there? You absolutely aren't locked in for uh, the full three years. When you want to upgrade, you can take what you've purchased and apply it to that upgraded price. So we'll give you the new price. It's going to allow you to move that forward. Now, likewise, let's say, hey, you know what? I don't want to prepay and I want to get out of it. There is a bit of a, a, a fee to get out of the agreement, but it's not as bad as you have. And there's a really good document, matter of fact, on the calculator that talks about the penalties if you have to move out. But I'll tell you what, when folks have had to do this, it's a very minimal charge. But we do charge you a little bit, um, but it's not like, okay, it's a $10 million penalty because you know it's not <laughs> how it works. And especially when you want to upgrade those machines, you can do so as well. And you basically take what you've purchased and apply that as a credit essentially inside the environment. But reserve instances, really great way to save money. And folks, you're thinking, oh, Matt is droning on about reserve instances. My personal experience, I saw questions on AZ-900, AZ-103, AZ-300, and AZ-301. Folks, you will be tested on this because sometimes our exam questions will always have a qualifier at the end of the questions. And you're going to see two qualifiers. Just exam tip for, for a moment here. Indulge me, folks. I hope you don't mind. Take a break from pricing for a moment. When you have exam questions, we're going to give you some kind of qualifier at the end of a question that's going to help you distinguish the right and wrong answers. And two of the most common qualifiers you'll most likely see on your exams, at least what I've seen on mine, you're going to give you a scenario, it's going to give you a solution, and it's going to say, choose the option that is the least administrative effort. In other words, which one is the easiest to do? And it's going to give you four different options. And one might be five steps, one might be 20 steps. Well, what's easier to do? The five steps, all right? Then you're going to have another option that says, of all these solutions, which one is the most cost effective? And you might see reservations in there. You might see hybrid benefit, which I'm getting ready to show you. Understand how you can save money. But more importantly, folks, real life, folks are going to ask you, wait a second, man, you're running this, Garrett. It's 150. Can you save money? Is there any way you can lower the cost? Well, yes, I can. And these are how we can do things. So be smart enough about your licensing. Know how to talk to your purchasing department to understand what your company's always purchased. Now I'm getting ready to show you something that might flip your brain. Remember, $150 a month is what we started at. We're down to 100 by just prepaying, 104. But what if you already had a Windows Server license? What if you already had a license that you bought for on-prem and you covered it with software assurance? You can leverage what is called the hybrid benefit. And really what that means, you take that license that you purchased on-prem and you bring it to bear inside of your Azure environment. That's called the hybrid benefit. I'm just going to make one little switch here. Watch what happens to that price. Same VM, haven't changed region, nothing else, no, nothing on my sleeve. It's like a magic trick. I click on it, now I'm down to $37 for the same exact virtual machine because I'm smart about my licensing. Folks, I'm not a licensed expert. I didn't want to be a licensed expert at Microsoft. Not to knock those folks because they're brilliant. I want to be a technologist but you have to understand how to price things and how you can save money. Because I guarantee you, as you move on your cloud journey, when you, especially when you start talking about virtual machines, two things are going to happen. One, how can I save costs in the virtual machine? And eventually they might say, you know what? I want to go into a PaaS service. Most of our PaaS services are going to be less expensive than virtual machines. So there's lots of ways to save money. You got to be smart about licensing as well as um, our, our, how, what service you use to leverage it. So same system that we're here. Now I want to show you a trick. And I'm going to show you a trick here for real life uh, inside of it. Now, when I scroll all the way down to my calculator here, um, we have this option that says licensing program. It says Microsoft Online Services Agreement. That's pretty much the page you go full retail pricing that we have for this. But if you have an enterprise agreement or another agreement with us as a company, how do you get what that pricing is? One little quick trick. So all I'm going to do is up here in the right-hand corner, just sign in. And I'm going to go ahead and sign in with my Microsoft credentials, and it actually auto signs in for me. And I'm going to scroll all the way back down to my calculator. And now notice at the bottom of this list, it says Microsoft Online Services Agreement. Now it says EA Agreement. So I can actually say EA, and, and I won't be able to fully show this, but it's there, and select my EA Agreement for my customer or whatever I have. And what will happen to this calculator, some kind of magical, it'll put your EA pricing inside of it. And then, because we're Microsoft, we don't have EA agreements, obviously reasons, but where you can get your real pricing. Now, when you're in your portal inside your subscriptions for your, customer, for your company, any price you see inside the portal will be reflective of your enterprise agreement. But you can use the calculator to get that real pricing as well, which is a little trick by simply signing into that calculator to work with it. So let me switch back. Oh, actually, you know why I'm here? We're not going to switch back. I just want to cover the total cost of ownership calculator real quick. Now, the calculator just showed you a pretty easy exercise. Put some stuff in, tell you how much you want, gives you a price. 
This is not one of those tools. The TCO calculator is basically our pizza as a service. How much does it really cost to make pizza at home? How much does it cost? How much does our, my oven cost? How much does it cost for my time and labor? How much does it cost for cleanup? All that stuff. We have that ability to do that from an Azure perspective. And we can look at what servers we want to move, what databases we want to move, what storage we want to move, what our networking consumption is. We can put this all into the calculator to help us get a total cost of ownership. And the other thing that we can do, if I go to the next step in the calculator, we can also factor in our different costs. Do we have software assurance? Do we have geo-redundant storage? Do we have virtual machines? What's our electricity cost? What's our storage cost? What's our IT labor cost? We have all these assumptions built into the tool. Now folks, the only thing I'll ask, if you use the TCO tool one, be patient. It's gonna take some time to build everything in here, but also be open and honest with this tool. The data you put in here, now you're seeing all those other costs associated with running a data center. And at the very end of this tool, when it's done, it's gonna spit out a report that's gonna show you this is how much it costs to run on-prem those solutions, and this is how much it's gonna cost and how much you can save by running them inside of Azure. And so we have that total cost of ownership. And whenever I see this, I'm thinking of pizza and how much it costs to clean the dishes and do everything we eat home. As Garrett says, if, if you cook, you don't have to clean. How do we factor those costs in when we start talking about data? Because when you look at that big machine where it was, what, $2,000 a month, understand that even on-prem, there's a lot of additional costs. And this tool is designed to help calculate that for you. So let me go ahead and switch back into our slides and finish off with some of the other things we have in, in the calculator. I talked about the total cost of ownership. What you're seeing here is an example of what the reports would look like uh, that are there, and there's some sample reports you can use. So how do you minimize costs? What are some best practices? Uh, use the calculators, use the pricing tools, uh, monitor your usage, as a monitor, use advisor. Advisor might come up with cost saving tips. You can set spending limits inside of Azure. Now the spending limits you set here um, are um, soft limits. In other words, when somebody goes over the spend limit, it's going to give them warnings. It doesn't turn them off. Now, with mine, uh, with my Visual Studio, it's a $150 limit, which means when I hit $150 spend in the month, it does deallocate everything until the next month until my credit, but that's unique to that subscription. Use reservations and hybrid benefit. Choose low cost regions. Keep everything up to date with your latest offerings. As we change Azure and we add features and functions, sometimes they will be cheaper than what you're currently doing. Use cost owners, use tags to help apply those things. There's lots of ways we can help minimize costs inside the Azure environment. We also have an Azure cost management utility where we can come in and get uh, patterns and seasonality. We can see how much virtual machines are costing us versus Azure functions versus storage. We have all that ability inside of cost management. We can even get recommendations from that. We have the ability to take Azure to the next level. So pricing, very important. What about support? We have lots of support options inside of Azure of how you can work with it. Now it all support, uh, starts with our support plan options. And what you see here is a subset of the support plan options that we can have. Basically, when you look at the support plans, you have the ability to pay uh, for support. We have basic support, which is free. You have developer support, which you get some limited capabilities, but we also have standard, professional, direct, and premier. Depending on what you want to use, they all have a price point. But the main things that customers choose support for is our SLAs to get back to you, our guarantee, but also what services you get. A lot of our enterprise customers, and maybe a lot of you watching this, uh, watching this uh, session, are have a premier. Why? Because you get a technical account manager. You basically get a quarterback for your resources, for your support issues. So if something goes wrong, you have a full-time Microsoft employee that's going to help and run with it to loop in all the right resources to solve whatever problems that you have. Now, I want to show you real quick, just a quick website that has all of this information. And this is in the fun path, the online learning path, the aka.ms slash az fun path. But when you take the exam, you're going to want to know these different agreements. I know in real life, folks, you have a support plan that you use for your organization. For the exam, you're going to be tested across the broad set of this. And so there's actually a website um, you can go to that has all of our support plans for you to use and leverage. And if you take a look at the website, you can see a lot of nuances between what the technical support is, what the response rates are, what the different severity is. We have all this up on the websites. If you go to uh, azure.microsoft.com slash support plans, you will find that and you have the different costs that are here. Now notice for the Premier, it says contact us. You have to have an enterprise agreement to have a Premier contract. They're fairly expensive. But once again, if your business is relying on Azure, it's great to have Microsoft in your corner if something does go wrong inside the environment. So understand these plans. Folks, just from the exam standpoint, you will be asked about these. Just review this table, understand what's available to you. In real life, if you have mission critical applications inside of Azure, guess what? 
you're going to use Premiere to work with that environment. So let me go back into the slides real quick. We also have alternative support channels. We have our MSDN Azure Foreman's, we have Stack Overflow, we have Server Fault, we have a general feedback channel. We also have a Twitter channel. Now, I heard a chuckle. I heard a chuckle all the way across everybody listening to me. Twitter really matter, are you serious? At Azure Support. Now, folks, I cannot stress to you, you have full-time Microsoft employees on this channel. You have community members, which are called Microsoft Valuable Professionals on this channel. What I'm trying to tell you is just don't make fun of it because it's Twitter. You have 400 level experts on these channels. And even in some cases from the Microsoft perspective, our employees have to be on the channel to help support our customers in this way. So you have very, very smart people here asking questions. So don't, you know, don't look at this going, hey, you know, it's Twitter, it's just going to be community advice. No, chances are you're going to have a full-time Microsoft employee that's deep in whatever you're asking, answering your question at a 400 level depth for free because it's inside of Twitter. Now, I don't know if I'd run a business on it, but folks, the folks there are the same folks you might get through premieres, through other agreements that are available to you. There's not always there for you. There's no SLA and how quick they'll respond to the Twitter, but it's definitely something we want to look at inside of Azure. We also have a knowledge center where you can query our knowledge center looking for different help, looking for virtual machines. A lot of documentation's up there. A lot of known issues might be up there. Kind of like the old TechNet uh, event center where if you had an event ID, you could put it in there and get an idea of what it's going to be. We have a knowledge center where you can go and get help. It's a searchable database. But we also have the ability to open a support request. Now let's have some fun with this. Now if Azure's behaving properly, let me show you how we open a support request. But more important, let me show you some of the things that Azure does on our behalf. So I'm going to hop back into my portal here and I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom and choose help and support. Now, I'm going to start the story here, how I open a support request, but I want to show you a little trick. And I'm going to come back to the screen. If I go into my virtual machines and I go into one of my virtual machines like FunVM2 and I scroll all the way down, I also have a new support request. The great thing about this, when I go here, it automatically fills in the context where I'm at so it says, hey, you're running a virtual machine running Windows, it's called FunVM2, it's already started to fill in the help and request tool for me. So I don't have to do it. By the way, pretty much everywhere inside of Azure, that new support request is available to you so you can save some time if you know you're having problems with a specific resource. Now I want to take you kind of the long way so I can show you what this looks like from, uh, from the get-go. So I'm going to go and scroll back down and go back into help and support. And they give us our community, there's our Twitter channel, we can access it right from the portal. I'm going to simply say new support request. It's going to say, what's your issue? Is it technical, billing, what's going on? We'll say this is technical. It's going to ask what subscription I'm going to have. It's also going to select a service. Uh, I'm having problem with a virtual machine uh, running Windows. It's going to say, what resource? I'm having trouble with the RBAC test VM. Um, in a words, uh, won't connect. What's my problem type? Uh, cannot connect to my VM. What's my sub problem type? Uh, my configuration is impacted, we'll say, put that one in there. Um, and notice what comes up. Hey, this is, it's, it's stopped and it's deallocating that machine. It's actually looking at this going, hey, something's on with this machine. The virtual machine is stopped and deallocated. In other words, turn it on. So when we go through the support and request, Azure has some technology behind it that's going to say, you know what? There's something wrong. And in this case, I knew the machine was turned off and this tool told me. So it ran across my subscription. It even gives me some recommended best steps to how to actually move forward inside of there. So I have the ability to troubleshoot this. I chose this machine purposely because it is turned off. It's going to get those high level basics, but this may not be enough for you. If I go next to details, this is where it comes in. You see my subscription. Hey, look, hey, why don't you call somebody and pay for a plan? If you have a premier agreement and you have a technical account manager, what'll happen from here is it'll actually open up the rest of the support request details, you'll fill in some information, and the technical account manager will get that request and then run for it. Most likely you're going to get a phone call, uh, depending on the severity, usually within a few minutes, with I think guaranteed within an hour, uh, and you'll hear from somebody at Microsoft and you'll start quarterbacking and solving whatever that problem is. So knowing how to open a support request is very important to our Azure environment. It's very important for you uh, as a customer to help, how do you get help? If something breaks, how do you work inside of it? How do you actually deal with those issues? And if you don't have a premier, a premier agreement, you have ways to get plans, pay for support instance, so you can help get resolution to whatever problem. And I hope you don't have any problems, but if you do, there's a lot of help here, a lot of free help. And if you have to go pay for somebody, it's fairly reasonable when we take a look at the support issues that you might have to, to pay for. So let me go ahead and switch back in and let's finish up some of the other topics inside of this module that are here. And let's talk about service level agreements. 
every Azure service inside of your subscriptions have service level agreements. Now, with the exception of virtual machines where you have to configure them in certain ways or use availability sets or availability zones, you have service level agreements. And all this basically means is, you know what? We define how much guaranteed uptime you have for a product. And if we as a company don't meet that requirement, we're going to pay you back a credit. They're financially backed service level agreements, but it talks about how, our def how we define how things are going to be performant for you. So when you have outages, how do we give you credits to say that? And, and trust me, here at Microsoft, we hate outages just as much as you do, and we work really hard to resolve them. And how do we work with that? Or how do we help meet those requirements? So first off, understand what we mean by service level agreements. It's measured in uptime. And every Microsoft product has anywhere between three nines to four nines on the average of uptime. What does that mean? Well, if you're three nines, that means downtime per year, per month is 43 minutes. Downtime for an entire year at worst would be eight, eight hours. If we don't adhere to that, you get credits based on that service. We guarantee that monthly request, and you might have some of your monthly fees waived, you might be get accredited, it all depends on what that outage looks like. Now, some resources inside of Azure, guess what? We have different service level agreements on how you configure it. So Cosmos uh, database, for example, if you configure it in a certain read-only perspective, you can get up to five nines, and that's for our services. Now, we talked about storage. Storage has its own SLA, and just kind of a fun note, L uh, Locally redundant storage, LRS, nine nines by default, and DRS, the last time I checked, 16 nines of availability. So we have different availability levels in our different areas of Azure. Now the challenge becomes is when you start working with multiple Azure services that have different SLAs. So as the writing of this slide, we had an SLA for the app services, which is uh, three and a half nines, and Azure SQL database had four nines. How do you calculate what the actual service level agreement is? you calculate it by multiplying the two percentages together and you come up with what's called a composite SLA. It is always going to be lower than the lowest composite. And the reason being is we have to factor in multiple points of failure here. We have a failure at the web app, which impacts the SLA for SQL and vice versa. So we have to be able to calculate it. And that would be what we'd have to adhere to as Microsoft for the SLA for that solution. Now, why do I show you this? Because you have to understand how to calculate it. You have to understand how it works with it. If you get a question like this on any of your exams, and just a general broad statement, if you get a question on any of your exams that requires you to do math, you do not have to do it in, a, in your brain, you'll be provided the Microsoft calculator to solve that problem. If you get this question on your exam, you simply multiply the two percentages together, and it'll give you the resulting percentage. And they just show you on the slide here, take it down to the decimal points, and it'll tell you what that actual percentage is. But understand we have those composite SLAs to help factor in the multiple points of failure. Application SLAs, when you start building those requirements, design for resilience availability. You determine the SLA based on what those application needs are going to be. Look at the metrics behind that application. How long does it take to recover? Or how long do we uh, tolerate failures? If you have recovery inside of that, what's our RPO, recovery point objective? What's our RTO, recovery time objective? How long do we bring these things back? So when you start looking at your applications, you have to look at a lot of factors. Like for example, we had the app services in the SQL database. Well, is there a way we can choose another service that has an higher, higher SLA than app services to do the same thing? These are questions you ask when you start architecting solutions inside of Azure, and then you build to those availability requirements. And when you look at things like virtual machines, by simply putting things in availability zone, you get four nines guaranteed SLA for those virtual machines that are in that availability zone. So we have all kinds of ways to do that. One of the last topics we're going to get into is service lifecycle management. When we take a look at all our products inside of our service lifecycle, we have three big stages. And along those stages, we have different costs and different SLA and support will come to bear. We have private preview. Private preview, very simply much, product is being reviewed by the product group. Generally, it's an invite only. We're looking for a very specific type of customer doing a very specific type of scenario with whatever feature. Now, if that feature survives through private preview, it goes to public preview, where customers then can open and test it. Remember, and we talked about this, I believe in module two, uh, when you're in preview products, do not put production stuff, do not pro put production stuff, do not put production stuff in preview. Friends don't let friends put stuff in production in preview. Hey Matt? Yes. Should I put my production workload in preview? No. Oh, okay. All right. You can, by the way, and this is the challenge, we can put production stuff in here, don't do it. Why? Because there's no guarantee the product will make it out of preview. Now with that said, we have a lot of faith in our product group. When things hit public preview, they're normally going to make general availability. How long that takes depends on the product. Generally, it's within six months to a year. When it hits public preview, it's going to become generally availability. 
That's when you can put things in production. You use gender availability. That's when it gets a cost, that's when it gets an official SLA and it gets official support, but not until it becomes GA along that life cycle. All right, so you also have the ability, um, we change our porter often, and this is a challenge for Garrett and his team and for myself is that we do live demonstrations. And so I never know what the portal is going to look like, but I can look at a preview of the portal. Everybody, customers, you have the ability, if you go to preview.portal.azure.com, guess what? You can get a preview portal experience. Now, it's a little flaky every now and again. You might have some refreshes where you have to work with it, but we're trying to navigate and give you the best experience. You have an ability to get feedback in a forum. You also have to report a bug. Say, hey, look, we're having an issue with this particular portal. We can give feedback back to the product group to design a better portal experience for you. And I will tell you folks, I have seen so many wonderful changes from the initial Azure portal to where we're at today. They really want to make the experience easy and intuitive. And you can kind of see what we're working on by going to preview portal. You have the ability to work with it and it'll be on your production environment. Now, quite frankly, if you're really doing everything day to day and you need to be there, don't use the preview portal. It's something if you want to test and kind of explore, but if you're trying to really do stuff inside of Azure, go to the real portal, portal.azure.com, because it's going to be that full functionality. You don't have to worry about any potential bugs uh, that are going to be there. We also publish our, not only can you look at the preview of our, uh, of our portal, you can look at the roadmap of our products. You have the ability to get into our roadmap and see what we're working on. Now, when you go into our roadmap, it'll show you what features we have currently in preview, what are in private preview, what features we've deprecated. In other words, sometimes when a new feature comes out in Azure, we're going to pull its old feature out. We're going to let you know that. We have the ability to look at the roadmap. You can do a quick search on the internet and do a search for the roadmap. You can look at all the data that's there. Now, the one thing I will prepare you for when you go to the roadmap, don't expect dates. We very rarely will tell you what the dates are for the resources. We're going to tell you, hey, here's the new feature we're working on. Here's why we're working on it. Here's if, it, if it's a public preview or private preview, here's where you can possibly sign up and go inside of it. So you can monitor those resources and work with it. So as you can see, even though we focused on the, the updates and you can see what's there, there's a lot to do with pricing and support. And folks, in real life, you may not do a lot of this, but know the calculator. If you do work in the community, know how to get the free service inside of Azure. Know what's there and know how to purchase. Be a little smart about licensing when you start having those costs inside of Azure. But for your exam, folks, there's a lot of memorization here. Know the support plans. Know the different way we can acquire Azure. Know the different tools we can use to control Azure costs from reservations to hybrid benefit as an example. So when you get ready to take your exams, module four is pretty important. And really, it is part of fundamental. How do we price and support our stuff? We have to know this at a real high level. But when you get in your exams, just a little bit of memorization here goes a long, long way. And that brings us to the end of module four. Thank you all for joining us over the last two days to learn about Azure Fundamentals. Today, we covered module three, discussing security, privacy, compliance, and trust. And then we finished with module four, where we talked about Azure pricing and support options. Congratulations to you. You made it through both days with us and you've officially completed this course. We wish you good luck on your exams and happy studying.